coming to you live from the Business Radio X studio. It's Franchise Marketing Radio, brought to you by IDS, an award-winning digital marketing agency that delivers integrated marketing solutions for franchisers, franchisees, and franchise development teams. Learn why over 75 brands depend on IDS's team of dedicated marketers and client service professionals to deliver a strong ROI on their marketing investment. Go to IDSFranchiseMarketing.com for a complimentary digital audit and consultation. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Franchise Marketing Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today on the show, we have Jonathan Weathington with Shuck and Shack. Welcome, Jonathan. Hey, Lee. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm so excited to be catching up with you. For those who don't know, tell us a little bit about Shuck and Shack. Sure. So my very, very abbreviated elevator pitch, let's say we're going from floor one to floor two. My abbreviated elevator pitch is if you like raw oysters and cold beer, you're going to like us just fine. That's that's the very brief one. The 30 second one is we are a uh, we're we're an oyster bar uh, franchise founded on the Carolina coast in 2007. We've since expanded into five states, soon to be two more states by the end of this year. And we serve fresh seafood, exceptional um Exceptional spirits, full service bar, craft beer, all of those things. Just a little bit of diff, little bit of a differentiator in the market, aside from what you would get in a normal sports bar or your normal bar scene. Can you talk about the origin story? Like, uh, how did this come about? Sure, it's and I actually just told this origin story last night, um, as it were, to to a group of folks asking me about the same things. It, you know, Shug and Shack started as a place where people wanted to hang out. The founders, I am not a founder of the brand. Matt Pickett and Sean Cook founded the brand in 2007. And it was in a sleepy beach town of Carolina Beach, North Carolina. And their goal was really to open a bar. Uh, they're both in their 20s. Who doesn't want to open a bar in their 20s? And I think they were a little surprised that it was so successful. And we talk about that all the time. Sean and I were just talking the other day about how things happen, right place, right time. And it just took off and opened the second location in 2012 in downtown Wilmington. So all of a sudden we had a little bit of proof away from the coast, more of in a central business district market. And then in 2013, 14, looking for a third location and decided to go the route of franchising. That's when they brought me on board. I was friends with them back when they opened the first initial, the first location. So we started franchising in 2014 and have been opening restaurants every year since. So what was your kind of background that you were the right fit to help them expand? You know, I like to think, I like to think my biggest background fit was personality. Um, Working with two founders, um, especially two founders that are very passionate about their business is it takes a certain person to do that. And myself, me personally, knowing them ahead of time certainly helped. So I, I think that was the biggest key to to our success and, and how we fit together thus far. However, my background, I have a really strong background in, in retail primarily, uh, of course, now restaurant and bar, but I've worked for some very, very large companies in the retail space, customer centric positions. Uh, I did a short stint in banking. I've done pretty much everything you can think of. Um, my my work history is, is highly varied, but always very customer centric, always very focused on customer customer service. And so what I brought to them was was I was able to use some of the experience and knowledge I had gained at some multi-billion dollar companies and able to implement some of those systems, procedures, and thought processes into the Shuck and Shack brand. So um, how did you kind of develop that avatar of the ideal franchisee? Yeah, it, it took a long time. At first, whenever you start franchising, there's this moment of, of it's just this really nebulous, I would say three, six months, maybe sometimes it lasts a year. And you're really just curious about who's going to be attracted to your system. We went through that. I think every other brand also goes through that. However, over time, as we brought people into our system as franchise owners, we learned, hey, we we really like this quality in a person. We like that they're outgoing. For instance, being outgoing, being primarily extroverted is a big deal uh, within our own system. We're in the hospitality industry, which means we has, have to be hospitable. And a part of being hospitable is is being extroverted and being outgoing and able to carry on a conversation and able to host people within your four walls and then making those connections outside of the four walls. So that was one of the things. And I think 
not only that, that's not just terrain to Chuck and Jack. I think that's very common in what you would see in other restaurant and bar franchises. But then beyond that, I think there's a real, uh, there's a real grit quality for lack of a better term. Grit is, is a big deal. Um, especially when you're talking about the restaurant industry as a whole, it is a difficult industry at times. Employee turnover can be high at times and you're, you cannot get caught in the day-to-day grind of it and lose sight of what your overall goal is, which is to serve your customer base and make sure they come back. That's all that really matters in the long run. And so those are two primary qualities that we look for in folks. And then, of course, over time, you develop what would be considered more soft skill learning, so more personality-based things. And then, of course, hard skills. You know, is this does this person have basic financial responsibility? Do they understand basic accounting, um, at least to the extent of controlling food and labor costs and all of those items? So when you kind of identify those attributes um, for that avatar of the ideal franchisee, now that you do that and you have these qualities, hard and soft skills, how do you then find this person? Like you can't just do a Google search for, you know, extroverts with grit. You know? <laughs> no, you can't. I wish you could. Um, that would uh, that would that might put the SEO and pay per click out of business if you could Google search for S, uh, for for people with grit and have extroverted personalities. We we use a number of ways. First, the the first and, and foremost way that we use, and this is very common to systems our size, is that we open healthy restaurants with happy owners. That's it. Happy owners tell people about the experience that they're happy that they're having. And they communicate that to interested parties that might also be interested in opening a restaurant and bar of their own. That is the first primary lead source. And then beyond that, we're, we're seeking out digital channels as well. So search engine optimization, pay-per-click uh, via Google, and, and less so Bing, um, and then doing some social media ads. It's really, I, I think if you're looking at it from an, an outsider's view and thinking, oh, that's easy. You just run commercial ads and seeking people. Um, it's like hiring. Well, yes and no. Some of the aspects of it are like hiring in that you do put out, hey, this is who we're looking for. Do you have a desire to do this? Do you feel like you have this quality internally? But then on the other side of things, it's a it's a massive brand to push as well. So you can't put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. You have to uh, participate in you know some franchise shows. You have to do all of the digital channels, like I mentioned before. You have to be, have a strong presence on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And you've got to communicate that same message, which is the absolute most important thing that you can do. You've got to come with a cohesive message to the market so that regardless of who the listener is, that they're seeing the same message throughout. And then their read on that message is, okay, the, these people have it together. They know what they're talking about. They're consistently saying these things, and they're also producing once the store gets open. So now, um, as you expanded and are growing, um, how did you guys navigate the uh, pandemic? How was your... Um you know, support system internally from corporate side, as well as uh, your franchisees that were the kind of the boots on the ground there. Was there any changes that had to happen that are maybe now kind of silver linings that maybe then now you're doing business a little differently and attracting a slightly different group? Or was everything just kind of boldly forward and just keep doing what we're doing? I think it was a little bit of both, and that's that's a total punt answer, but it is the truth. Um, you know, looking at the pandemic as a lessons learned experiment at this point, we can look back at certain decisions that we made and, and very, very clearly say, yes, we definitely did that correctly. You know, for example, we going into the pandemic and delivery seemed to, to reach a fever pitch. We, we sat down internally, we spoke with our franchisees, and, and the overall and overarching message was, you know, seafood typically doesn't travel all that well. And, you know, with the delivery companies cut on, on the items that we're sending out the door, we would rather put our money into marketing and rather put our money into the I marketing. Mean, this is franchise marketing radio. We would rather put our money into direct to consumer marketing that says, if you like us, come to the curb and pick up your food. So that helped us control some of those costs. I mean, because if you're looking at delivery companies as a whole, you're talking 20 to 30 percent of, of whatever's going out the door. It's a loss leader. You're losing money every time something walks out the door. 
And so we decided to turn that on its head and say, if we're willing to give up this money as food walks out the door, let's take that money, put it into a marketing budget. Let's market to our customers that what we're doing internally, when you're allowed to come back, this is what we're doing internally. And we want you to come back safely and dine with us so that when you do want to escape your home, your compound, and you are choosing maybe to eat out once a week safely with your family or with a couple or whomever it may be, that you will choose us. And then on top of that, hey, we're going to be waiting for you at the curb. Seafood doesn't travel directly. We're not going to trust the delivery companies as a whole to deliver it effectively. But we know that if you come and you call us, we'll have it to you and it'll be hot by the time you get home. So we doubled down on those things. And that was that was a very, very critical decision on our end. We decided that we weren't going to be able to compete with pizza. We weren't going to be able to compete with Chinese delivery or some of the other delivery options out there. And so we weren't we didn't put an, a ton of money or effort into that. So those are some of the pandemic lessons learned in that. And as a part of that, you know, what helped us make that decision was, like you said, doubling down, continuing to forge forward in what we know and who we are. We're very fortunate in that we know exactly who we are. And so we never had to question our direction in that. And uh, it was enforcing when our franchise owners all reopened after COVID and, and have done extremely well moving out of COVID. So now the experience, uh, obviously the seafood element is there. That's part of your name. But the bar part is also an important component of a successful restaurant. Can you talk about how that's going and uh, maybe some innovation on that side? Sure. So the bar component is is huge. About thirty percent. Our system averages thirty percent alcohol sales, which is which is pretty strong. If you look at casual dining as a whole, thirty uh, percent is way up there. So we have doubled down on that over time uh, for two reasons. Number one, it's our true identity. So Shuck and Shack. We talk about the early days, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Shuck and Shack was a dive bar that served great food. That's how Shuck and Shack started. And if you remember from my initial conversation, initial storytelling, it was open because two 20, 20-somethings wanted to open a bar and have fun. And that, that was the whole impetus behind Shuck and Shack. We have maintained those roots. The bar always plays a focal point at all of our restaurants. It can be seen from the front door. Uh, we make it a part of the show, quote unquote, of what's going on within the restaurant. It's a big deal. So we've maintained that. That's the first reason. The second reason and why we continue to push that as a part of our uh, advertising, as a part of our social media, and even when it comes to franchisee recruitment is because it's profitable. The profitability behind your liquor sales and your beer sales, draft beer, bottled beer, uh, you know, liquor drinks, cocktails is higher than what you would see typically uh, coming out of the kitchen. And so if we can do 30% of our business at the bar, we have a really, really strong profit center that uh, helps us produce higher profits within the restaurants because it's such a significant portion of our business. So what has been kind of the most rewarding part for you in the growth of Chuck and Jack? Seeing other people be successful. That's it. I answer that question the same way every time is, you know, seeing other people be successful and, and ancillarily as a part of that, walking into any one of our locations across the country and seeing the same feelings that I had, because I, again, I'm not a founder that I had as my first customer experience, meaning I felt welcome. I felt like I belonged there. I'd only been there one time, but I was told to sit down. They'd be with me in just a second. Having all of those feelings and seeing that um, imparted on the rest of our customer base and them getting to experience those things as well has been the most rewarding part to me, you know, and going back to to my first point, seeing the franchise owners be successful. That's it. You know, we we are we are in a results driven culture. We're in a results driven company. And quite frankly, the franchisor doesn't succeed unless the franchisees succeed. And the only way that happens is if they're happy and they're profitable. And we think that we have we think that we've been able to do that pretty well. So what's next? Uh, what do you need more of and how can we help? Uh, I want to open healthy restaurants. That That's what we need more of is more healthy restaurants. That's it. We, we get asked all the time, hey, what's your number? You know, what are you guys looking at? When do you want to get out? You know, of course, all those conversations lead in one direction. And my response is always, I want to open healthy units. That's it. And I want good people to open those units, people that can participate in their community. They're outgoing. They're extroverted. They understand how to have a conversation. They have some of those hard skills that we discussed. And that's that's what we're after. That's what we want. So if somebody wants to learn more, have a more substantive conversation with you or somebody on the team, where should they go? Sure. The easiest thing to do, if you're interested in a franchise with us, you can go to shuckandshackfranchise.com. There is no G on shucking. shuckandshackfranchise.com. 
All right. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're doing important work, and we appreciate you. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate it. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Franchise Marketing Radio.